So Joel chapter 3 is where we're going to be at again uh, today. And uh, and we're going to look at several different things. Um, in the first part of, of this, we're, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read, uh, I'm just going to read a couple of ver uh, a verse or two at a time. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open us up in prayer and then we're just going to kind of get into it. Uh, so dear Lord, I just want to ask that you would just give me the right words to speak, the things to say to, uh, at, uh, as, uh, as your word, as, as we dig into your word this morning, Lord, help us that we can study it properly and then that we can take these things that we learn and understand how to apply them to our life. And we just ask you, Lord, that you would just guide us in, the, in your precepts and understanding and help us, Lord, that as we see these days approaching, that we will not forsake to assemble the way that you'd have us to, that we will not forsake to be your people and to be those who are called according to your gospel message. Lord, would you just help us to yeah. do your will and to apply these things to our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> All right, so in Joel chapter 3, if you'll look with me in verse 1, it says, For behold, in those days, now, it says in those days, if you remember last week, we are talking about the time period between um, but, but before, before God's wrath and after the restoration of Israel. Okay, so we're, we're or, or at least during the times of, of the resurrection of, uh, of the re restoration of Israel and before God's wrath. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. So that's that's what we're going to be looking at. That's that's the time period. So when it says, "For behold, in those days," that's the days that we're talking about. And here we dig. We, as we last week, you know, we talked about some of the signs that that uh, that God would do. You know about you know the the God pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh, believers and uh, sons and daughters would prophesy according to verse twenty eight, and old people would dream dreams. Young people will see visions. There's going to be wonders in the heavens and blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun turned to darkness, the moon to blood before that final day. And, it's, and we end it with that it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's, that was verse 32 of chapter 2. So we get into, so it continues on when we get into chapter 3. It says, for behold, in those days, which days are we talking about? The final call, the whosoever call, the final chance that this world is going to have to be saved. That's what we're talking about. Those days when God is put, when, when we actually see the convergence of all the prophecies that have been illustrated in the scriptures, just it just looks like if you can't see it, well, you're, you've got to be dead. Because even blind people can see this. Even deaf people can hear this. But there's people that even though it's so blatantly obvious, they still will rebel against the Most High God. They love their sin way too much. Even though God is saying, when you see these times coming, it's gearing up for the day. The day that we're talking about, the day of the Lord, his wrath, it's coming upon this world. It's coming upon the wicked, God's people. You know, I'm glad that it says that God's people do not have to be a part of the day of the Lord. God's going to remove us some way. We're not going to be here to go through that, but it's a terrible day. Joel says it. It's a terrible day, and it's coming. But he says, this is what you're going to see right before that happens. Joel, chapter 3, verse 1. It's the second part. It says, and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. He says, I will restore Israel. I'm going, to give them a, I'm going to give them their property back. 
and I'm going to draw them back to this property. Caden, can you show that chart for me? <coughs> so, so the call is going to go out, and, and God is going to bring his captive Israel, uh, children back. And pull, bro, scroll up a little bit so we can see the dates on that. Go on up a little bit more. No, the other direction. Keep them. There you go. There, we've got some dates. Beginning around nine, 1919, you see, God has been calling his people back. That's the immigration to Israel. Two big spikes in there. Those two big spikes actually mean something. And we're also prophesied. I'm not going to get into all that today. But it's amazing. Not only was the call, but the two big spikes were actually prophesied too. He said this, that would be the sign. One of the final signs just before the day of the Lord. You can go ahead and, and, uh, and, and, and go back, uh, Caden. Look in verse 2. It says, And I, also, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and plead with them. There. I tell you what, go, to the, go back to that, go to that other map. He says, I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people. And for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. You know, here it, it, it gives us two details. It says, can you stretch that out? There you go. It tells us two things. He says, I'm going to bring them down to this valley. Now, this valley, do you see that red dot right there? That's where it's at. You see Jerusalem to the side? That's where this is talking about. He says, I'm going to draw all nations to this point. I'm not sure what's going what's gonna to happen that's going to make Israel the point or bring Israel to the point that all the nations are actually going to come to this central location. I have some ideas, but I don't know exactly. But you can just know. You just keep your eye on Israel. What's going on there? Are the nations turning against Israel? Are, they gonna turn, are the nations going to blame Israel for something? We'll see what's going to happen. I don't know. But God says all these things. He says this is a sign. When all the nations start to just hate Israel so bad that they are ready to do something very desperate to, 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 that, to that little country. So they're all going to become critical. And they're all going to be drawn to this point in the world. And he says, and I will plead with them there. He's going to draw all the land... All the people there. And then something else is going to happen too. That area, that area that you see right there, <clears throat> I didn't get a map of it. But it says that the land, and it says, and whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now, this is a very interesting prophecy. It was also a, pro uh, a prophecy that we see uh, from the book of Daniel. That he'll cause in Daniel 11 and verse 39. Uh, I didn't put that verse on there, Caden. I'm sorry about that. And he says, and shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. So if you see the, that area of Israel divided, he's like, that's a sign. Well, if you understand what has happened in history just, just after World War II area, the United Nations, this is what it says. The, if you go to like, I think this is Wikipedia is where I got this. It says the United Nations partition plan for Palestine. Well, Palestine was the name that they called Israel. You know what partition means? To divide. To part. They parted the land. They divided it up. They divided the land as in Daniel. Here it says they partitioned. It was a partition plan. It was a proposal by the United Nations which recommended a partition of mandatory Palestine at the end of the British mandate. On the 29th of November, 1947, the UN General Assembly adopted the plan as Resolution 181. The resolution recommended the creation of independent Arab and Jewish states and a special international re uh, regime for the city of Jerusalem. So they parted the land in 1947. Guys, do you, do you realize what we're seeing? 
We, some of you, I don't know, some of you may have, you know, may have seen this, or at least your grandparents, or at least your parents did. Your parents saw this happen. Not only did Israel get their land back, but they divided it at the same time. They fulfilled two prophecies, one whack. 1947. These things you would see just before the day of the Lord. Look with me in verse 3. And it says, And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Do you know what this means? It means that there would be a substantial return to slavery in the world. That's what it's talking about. You know, we thought that whenever they passed the 18th, I think it was the 18th Amendment in the Constitution, that was going to end slavery worldwide, right? There's more slaves today than there was than during the days of the Civil War when that, when that act was passed. Did you know that? The Scripture says that there would, be, there would be a lot of slavery. And what we actually see is that there is actually a 40 million people that are estimated to be trapped in modern slavery worldwide. Now, we're not talking about just slave labor. We're talking about the, the sex slave industry. We're talking about child labors. We're talking about just all kinds of stuff, whatever it is. There's all kinds where people are taking advantage of other people and giving them no money for it. They're not paying them for their services. They're using them to make money off of them. 40 million people worldwide. They say that, and, and here's, the, here, here's, what, here's some of the statistics on that. One in four are kids, they're children. Almost three quarters, 70, 71% are women and girls. And if you think the United States is exempt from it, they say that there's about anywhere from 40 to 60,000 slaves in our own country. They're just hidden. They're hidden in secrets because it's illegal. You know, they actually caught, they caught a guy here in Jonesboro about, what was it, a year and a half, two years ago? Running a restaurant. And the woman who was doing, doing all the cleaning in it, she was his slave. That was in Jonesboro, Arkansas. You thought all that stuff was gone, didn't you? You know, the only thing that's going to that's gonna change the, the sinful nature of of. of the world is not going to be laws that are written on people's books, but God's law written on their hearts. That's the only thing that's going to change it. And what we're seeing is we are seeing the worst of humanity start to come back. Just like Jesus said, it, was be, it would be as in the days of Noah. Just like during the days of Sodom, it would be like those days. And we are seeing the return of that. We've never seen this kind of stuff in the world. Yeah, it's, slavery's always been around, but not like it is now. I mean, it's, it, it's bad. You start looking at the missing, missing people, missing children reports, missing people reports, it'll blow your mind. It'll also blow your mind when you type in their name and it comes up on, on a site like Amazon or Walmart where you can actually buy shoes in that person's name for $5,000. You know, there's investigations on that. I'm not just making this stuff up. Joel said you would see that return in those days just prior to the day of the Lord. Over 10,000 were identified as potential victims by the authorities in the UK in 2019. That's what they're admitting in the United Kingdom. <clears throat> Look at me in verse 4. It says, Yea, what have I to do with thee, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Now, Tyre and Zidon and all the coast of Palestine, what this is talking about, this is talking about the, the country that we now know of as Lebanon, okay? So keep that in mind as we remember the, the, the rest, of, as we say the rest of this verse. Will you rip? Excuse me, will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return to your, your recompense upon your own head? Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my godly pleasant things. The children also of Judea and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them from, 
far from their border. So what do we see in, this, in these verses? Well, this is basically what it's saying. That in those final days, that Israel is going to have a really big problem with Lebanon. <laughs> when you see Israel and Lebanon just constantly going at it, you know those days are close. Have you checked the news lately? I just pulled up a couple articles. This is from August 13th. Are Israel and Lebanon heading for another war? August the 6th. Lebanon's Hezbollah and Israel trade fire amid Iran tensions. Another one from August 6th. Hezbollah and Israel trade fire in a dangerous Mideast escalation. You know why those, those dates are in August? That's, when I, that's kind of when I was doing this outline. That's when I was putting it together. You can find current stuff that happened yesterday. Because why? Just like Joel said, Lebanon is going to be a problem for Israel. This renewed state, the people that God has called back, they're going to have problems with it, and they're going to attack Israel all the time. Israel's going to have a constant issue with it. Well, that's what Israel's been having an issue with that for a long time, for a couple years now. With Lebanon. And Joel, he told us, when you see that, that's one of the signs. The day of the Lord is very, very near. Look with me down in verse 7. It says, Behold, I will raise them out of the place wherein you have sold them and return your recompense upon your own head. The Jews are going to continue to come back. And even despite all of those countries around not wanting the, the Jewish state there, God's going to continue to bring the Jews back. And he says, those surrounding countries, they're going to consistently be beaten by God's people. That's basically what that verse is, is telling us. Now look at... Uh, at verse 9. Or, yeah, look, go ahead and look at verse 9. It says, Proclaim ye this at, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come in all ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about. Thither calls thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. I just showed you that map. But what we see here is that there's just going to be a great desire. Verses 9 and 10 just says, shows us that the nations of the world are all going to be preparing for war. In fact, they are want, going to want to fight one another. I mean, we're going to see it on a scale even greater. Now, now you're, you could say, well, you're talking about World War II. Well, the problem with World War II and prior to that being, being part of this is that Israel hadn't been restored as a state at that time. We're talking about after God has restored Israel, some things that we would see. So Israel would be a state and, we'll, and God is going to work through that. And there's a lot of other things that's going to be going on. But he's like, when you see these things, that's when you know the time is near. And when you see that happen, and then you see this happen again, because World War II is supposed to be the war to end all wars, right? And they, they, they assemble the United Nations, and we're going to make sure that this kind of stuff never happens again. And you know what we see? It's about to happen again. I mean, even inside of countries, there's, it looks like civil war is just brewing inside of many, many countries. In Australia, uh, France, even the United States. It's like nobody is exempt from what is going on. It's like war is in the hearts and the minds of so many people. And God says, that's what, you, yeah, that's what you're going to see in those last days. It's going to be like you've never seen it before. And those nations are going to be drawn to Israel, to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Look at verse 13 with me. Actually, let's go to 14 first. 
It says multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. You know, what's, you know what he's talking to? He's talking about that day. Everybody's going to be drawn. The whole, all the nations are going to be drawn to this valley. And Joel says it's the valley of decision. Like this is the place where you're going to die. How do you want to die? You want to die absent from Almighty God? Or you, or you want to make sure that you're with God on this day? This is the valley of decision. You really only have two choices. You have the choice to serve God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or you have the choice to say, well, I'll just, I'll just keep playing this game with God. I'll just keep doing what I like to do because that's just what I like to do. And you're just playing games with him. Well, that only lasts so long. God's going to bring the whole world to this valley of decision. Just like Joshua said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. you gotta, you got to choose today. In the valley of Jehoshaphat. And they come down. Look at verse 13. We see something here. It says, put ye in the sickle. For the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down. For the press is full. The fats overflow. For their wickedness is great. You know, this is not the first time that we've seen this. If you're a Bible student... You've seen this expression before. Anybody, anybody know where this expression is found? There's a few people that doesn't like this. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want people to know. Look at me in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Look at verse 17. And it says, Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Now, if you want to know the context of what's going on in 14, John is seeing a vision uh, of two different uh, individuals with sickles. One steps out and looks like Jesus, and he is commanded to reap the world because it's ripe unto harvest. The next one is an angel that comes out. And he is commanded to reap. And that, that's the one that I'm going to read, read to you, just beginning in 17. It says, Another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Same terminology, right? Same idea that we see in the book of Joel. And the angel thrust in his sickle, in verse 19, into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of what? The wrath of God. So if you want to know what Joel chapter 3 and verse 13 is talking about, those that are being reaped right there, those who have been drawn into the, uh, into the valley of Jehoshaphat, those who are coming, the multitudes that are in the valley of decision, they are, being, they are going to be reaped. And thrown into the winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden throughout the city. Look at what it says. This is, how, this is how that ultimately ends. Blood came out of the winepress even unto the horses' bridles. And by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. I don't know how big that is. But I do know how tall the horse is. It's about this tall. That's where his bridle is going to be. That many people are going to be killed in that battle. That it fills up this huge area with blood of those people. There could be billions of people that center in on this. And God destroys every one of them. And you know what? Every single one of them, God reached out to and he said, this isn't the way it has to end. This isn't the way, the direction you have to go. It can be better than this. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. That's the day of decision for the world. Now that's for the world. But the real day of decision is for you is today. 
Today is the day of salvation. Do you hear some of the things that I'm telling you? God told Joel, when you see these things coming, know that that day is close. And though you look around and you see the wickedness of this world is great, you don't have to be a part of it. In fact, you need to fight it. You need to fight it that it doesn't, that it doesn't come in and consume your life. That you stand against it because the devil wants you to give in. He wants you to go along, to get along with this world. He wants you to just play that game so that you don't have to face any kind of obstacles in this world. And you can just, you can just kind of go with it. But that's not the way God has ordained it for his people. We are countercultural. If you think, well, Brother Mitch, you probably should just leave the library thing alone. I want to. But there's something inside of me that says that if I won't fight for, for, for the kids, who's going to? If I don't stand up for righteousness, who's going to? And that's, that's just one, that is a small piece. The big piece is going to be in your life. When Satan reaches out to you through your, through your phone or through the television set or through the, or through the other things that are going on in your life. And he, is, and he is trying to draw you to this valley of Jehoshaphat with him. You say, well, Brother Mitch, I, I said a prayer one time. There's going to be a bunch of people praying on that day. But what's, who is going to be rescued are the ones who truly do what happened back in Joel chapter 2 and verse 32. They called upon the name of the Lord, not just one day, but every day. They knew they couldn't make it in their own strength. They knew they couldn't make it in their own power. So they called upon the name of the Lord because they knew that was the only name in whom they could trust. They couldn't trust themselves. That's the day of decision. Look at verse 15, Joel chapter 3. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. There's going to be something unique happen that day. The lights, it's, it's, it's going to be, just, I think it's going to be like that day that Jesus died on the cross. You remember reading about that in the scripture? God just kind of blackened it. He didn't want the world to see his, his son suffer. This is going to be so bad. It's going to be right next to that. So bad. Billions of people that could have said yes to Jesus said yes to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about people you know. Do you realize that's how near this is? It is very likely that there's going to be people that you know today that will be involved in this valley. They will be sucked into this stuff. You know why they're going to be there? Because they're not here today. They're not anywhere where God's word can penetrate their hearts and their minds. They don't care about such things. And that's where we need to be the ones who stand in the gap. Because we've only got a little time left. And we, need to, and we need to fight harder right now for those people than you've ever fought for them. Because this day is coming. Maybe you don't believe it like I do. I believe it. I've seen the signs. Everything that Joel said would happen is happening as we speak. What does that mean? Souls are on the line, not just their lives. We're talking about eternal destinies are on the line. And there's only going to be one way that they don't go to hell, and that's if you or somebody that is a believer gets the gospel to them. But if we all sit back and say, well, it's just been like this for a long time, that's a lie. Look around. It has never been like it is today. It's worse than it's ever been. And corruption is just, it's the scandal is everywhere. And it goes from the, 
And it is, and it is, it is a, after your children, and it extends all the way to the highest office of this country. That's the shape that we're in. It's never been like that before. Yet Joel says that's the way it's going to be in those last days. Why would he tell us he wants you to have the right heart? He wants you to think about what is really going on in the hearts and the minds of people. Look at verse 16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. You know, I've learned something. That if I put my hope in some earthly leader, they're going to let me down. But my hope is not in them. My hope is in the Lord. And until he removes me from being able to present his word, then that's what I'm going to be doing. And you know, and that's the call to every believer. Maybe your maybe you're calling isn't precisely like this, but everybody can't be here. People need to be where you're at, wherever it is that you're at. Believers need to be there. But true believers, the ones that say that they're believers, they, they need to act like true believers. As the scripture says, let the redeemed say so. I want to show you some scriptures. Because it says, the Lord shall roar out of Zion. Hey, something awesome is going to happen in Zion. In Zechariah chapter 14, it's really just a, I don't know, about 20 pages or so to your right in your Bible. Zechariah chapter 14, where verses 1 through 7, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. You understand the valley of decision, the multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision, the valley of Jehoshaphat, that's part of the day of the Lord. Here we have, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of the eye, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the, and the city shall be taken and the houses rifled, rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go into captivity, and the re residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight among, against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the mist towards the east and towards the the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountains shall, shall remove towards the north, and half of it towards the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azil. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled before the earth in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Awesome verse there. You know what that verse means? Let me tell you what that whole story means. That means that all the nations are going to come to Jerusalem. And it's going to be horrific what's going to happen that day. There's going to be people killed. There's going to be shameful acts against women and children on that day. But God Almighty is going to stand up. And he's going to fight all of those wicked who came there to try to destroy a people group that God has worked with. But see, the thing is, Jesus is coming back. And he says he plants his feet on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is where he died. Same mountain. But this time, he's not coming to die on the cross of it. He's not coming to plant, be planted on a cross. He's coming to plant his foot as ruler and dominion. And when he does, he splits that mountain right down the middle. There will be no more crosses put there on that mount that day. Because it's going to be divided in half. Jesus Christ is personally coming back. Just like he came before, he's coming again. But this time, he's not coming alone. It says, look what he says. 
and the Lord my God shall come. If you've ever wondered if Jesus Christ is the Lord God, here we, here we have it. He's included in this, and he says, shall come and all the saints with him. You know how all the saints come back with him? All the saints have to be with him. He comes back with all his saints. And he's not coming back to save people. He's coming back to put an end to those wicked who have gathered themselves at the valley of Jehoshaphat. Let me show you one more passage in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse 11. It says, and I, saw and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Any idea who this character is? It's Jesus. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Anybody afraid of horses? You got to get over it. He said his armies are on white horses. Zechariah just said he's coming back with all of his saints. How are they coming back? Revelation 19 says they're riding white horses. Clothed in fine, in fine linen, white and clean. All the problems of this world are taken away from you. From those people who are coming back with Jesus. We don't have issues anymore. God's cleaned us up. And his, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. That with it... He should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. If you're wondering who is going to initiate the wrath of Almighty God, well, it's, it's the Word. It's faithful. It's true. It's Jesus. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know who's coming back with him? Those who have said, He is my king. He is my Lord. They're the ones who come back with him. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the, of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. You see, God's not looking at your position here on this earth and saying that you, you, you're going to get a free pass because you were elected to a certain office. If you're wicked, you're wicked and God's got a, God's got a message for you. It's not going to end well. Do you believe in his word? Hey, Joel gave us the signs. God doesn't look at the president of the United States and says, oh, you get a free pass because you're president of the United States. No, if, if anything, he looks at them even more and says, you're going to be held even more accountable because of your wickedness and your violation of my scriptures. And he, this is what he says. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. You see, they're coming to Jerusalem. It's not just about Jerusalem. It's about they want to be able to Satan wants to fight the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Satan, you lose. If you're if you're of your father the devil, you lose. Have you read the back of the book? God and his people win. Despite 
all the nonsense that we go through every day. And you know, that's what I kind of try to keep my eyes focused on. That is the battle that I face here in this world is not just the battle in this world that I'm going to lose. Hey, God's just preparing me for something even greater because I know ultimately, though the battle looks like it's lost here, the war is won. And Jesus Christ wins. Look what he does. And he saw, and the beast was taken. Now, if you've been under my teaching, you know what I think about the beast. The beast is a government system that plunges all the people of the world to do the horrendous and wicked things that they do. They don't stand up to it. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't make sure that laws are kept. They just do whatever they want to do their way. And they just kind of willy-nilly things through their life. And they just want to take advantage of people. That's the beast system, okay? And I, and I, could, I could show you even more if you wanted to. But just know, the beast system is gathered up all those people. Whoever is all involved with it. And then he says, And the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. And these were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. These guys, they don't even get to go to hell. They go straight to the lake of fire. They don't even get a chance to die first. They do not pass go. They do not collect $200. They go straight to the lake of fire. That's not my judgment. That's God's judgment. You know, the story does continue on, but I'm not going to finish it. I'm not going to finish all that today. But I just want you to know something. That you're going to go through tough times in this world. And the battles that we face... They're hard. And they're going to get harder until the day comes that God says, all right, you fought hard enough. It's time for you to go. Your battle's over. At least this one. And it doesn't matter if they kill you today or you die of natural causes. To be absent from the body is to be present with, the, with Jesus Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us. And we need to keep the right focus in this world because it's so easy to be distracted and to be sucked into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Multitudes upon multitudes in the valley of decision. I want to challenge you today. Make this decision. To serve the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Do you know Jesus Christ as your King and as your Lord? Do you know him today? Do not turn away. Today's the day. Know Jesus as the song leader and the pianist would come. Would y'all pray with me too, Lord? I just ask that you would just touch our hearts and our minds. I know, I know I gave a lot of information, and I know that some of this stuff is really difficult to understand, but Lord, I just I, I just ask that you just plead with your people that they would be the witnesses that you have really called them to be in these last days I don't want to see anybody go to hell I don't want to see anybody go to the valley of Jehoshaphat I want them to be with you I want them to be part of that number part of that all that comes back with Jesus Christ part of that group that is of God's army in heaven who returns with Jesus Christ. Part of that group who gets, who gets to see all of your wonder and all of your graciousness. Lord, would you help us to be your people today? Strengthen us. Make us better than what we really are. And to prepare us, Lord, for the days that are coming ahead that we will be able to fight the battles here on this earth the way that you would have us to. And not to, not to surrender because it just seems like it's too hard. But Lord, that you would just embolden us and strengthen us. Give us those wings of an eagle that, uh, that the psalmist talked about. That we'll be able to run and, and not grow faint. 
that we'll walk and we won't be weary. Lord, would you, would you strengthen us in that way? So God is Lord in all these things. Help us to understand really what is going on in this world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would stand with us and turn to number 358.